and yeah, let me underscore that. This this says educational <laughs> technology. This is a this is like Constantinople and Istanbul. There's no educational technology anymore. Please, please memorize learning design and technology as our new name. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is what we're about. And the names on here, there's only three of us speaking, but there's two more who are here in spirit. And I just want to talk a little bit about them. Let me go back. Yep, well, technology sucks. <laughs> 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 Helen Noble is one of the people participating in the study that we'll be describing and uh, couldn't be here today. And, and this is a sign of the times. John Whitmer is my co-PI in this study, and I only met him like a month ago uh, for the first time, long after the study was uh, underway. We meet constantly uh, uh, online and, and, and get things organized, but uh, he's in the Chancellor's office and has been uh, amazingly uh, just a, a great person to work with in getting this going. So, learning analytics, oh, for the title for this presentation, by the way, as many things do, came up as a sort of a committee meeting. There was a bunch of people sitting around the table at ITS, and they came up with this secret sauce thing uh, as, as a title. And so it was only yesterday that I realized, God, I better make a connection to secret <laughs> sauces somehow. So, so here's, here's, here's the, wh <laughs> when did you first hear the word secret sauce? McDonald's, it was Big Mac. They, they claimed to have a secret sauce. So here's the connection. The secret sauce in a Big Mac isn't really a secret. It's Thousand Island dressing. And, uh, and our secret that we're going to talk about here today, at least the secret of learning analytics as it stands right now, is not so secret. It's just being uh, systematic and deliberate about the kinds of data that is already available to you. Uh, in inside Blackboard, but we're going to talk about we're going to allude to some of the things we'll be able to do with the new version of Blackboard uh, next year, as well as maybe we'll get a chance to talk about some of the other more advanced things that some some of which are kind of secret. So, what is learning analytics? Boy, go, let me go back. Let me ask you, what is learning analytics? <laughs> it's the measurement and collection. Yeah, <laughs> you're a fast reader. Well, if you had to put it into words that your grandmother would understand, what do you think learning analytics is? Measuring. Measuring, OK. <coughs> learning is probably involved in some way. Yeah. yeah. Well, all right, so here's the answer. Uh, it's, it's about measuring with, for the purposes of understanding and optimizing learning in the environments in which it occurs. And uh, this definition is part of the call for papers at a conference uh, in, in 2011. I remember seeing that call for papers and wanting to go to it um, because it was the, the beginnings of a whole new field, really. And, and this field started primarily because we now have so many people learning in situations in which the data is all over the place. They are, they are logging into this and watching that, and we can measure all of those things. And so for the first time, uh, we have the ability to really look and see all the things that are happening to a learner inside a, a learning system. So, you know, you got all that data, you might as well do something with it. This first conference uh, was three years ago, and the last one was just last week, and my co-PI uh, actually had to go to Indianapolis and, and attend it. Um, so, uh, it is a growing field. It's got its own organization, and if you go to that organization, it's much as that conference, it says they also have a journal. Uh, but if you click on the journal link, it says there are, there are no issues yet. Uh, so it, it's obviously a new and exciting area with its own, its own sort of subcult and secret handshakes and everything. And, and so just for that reason alone, it's interesting and it's worth following and worth knowing more about. It. So in our study, we picked two courses, and I'll talk about the specifics of those in a bit. But, but Mark Lamakis uh, is the subject, the focus of half of our efforts here. So he's going he's gonna to take I'm over. The guinea pig. The guinea pig. Do I have the mic up? Oh, yeah, you should have the I mic. I should steal the mic from you. You should. Did the music go away? Yes. I'm glad it wasn't just in my head. <laughs> I was hearing that music thinking, no, not that. Not that. Don't take that. that. Where am I clipping? No, Does it matter where I clip? Am I good? I'm good there? Yeah. All right. It's still playing? Yeah. Ah. I feel like I want to sing along. Um, I want to talk to you about my course, which, as Bernie said, is one of the two courses that's part of the study. 
Um, I actually have two sections of 500 student Psych 101 classes. So this is my intro psych class, which I have been teaching. I, I woke up in the middle of the night thinking about how many years I've been teaching this with this many students. Um, this is at least the 10th year that I've had two sections of 500 each. So you start doing the math. I've taught more than 20,000 people intro psych. When I go out to eat, I run into former students all the time. I don't know if that gets me better service or worse service, but it happens all the time. This spring, um, it's still in a blended learning format, which started back in 06, Marcy, was that when we started? Marcy helped get this underway back in 06. Um, and back in 09 was when we made the transition to Tuesdays being face-to-face -face and Thursdays being online. In the fall, it could be the opposite. Um, but basically, we meet face-to-face -face one day a week, and then the other day, we have live online sessions. Literally this morning, I came into my ITS office, sat down at 8 o'clock, taught from 8 to 9.15 online, took a little break, taught the same thing again from 9.30 to 10.45, and then came over to talk to you. So the rest of the day today, I will not be speaking at all. Um, <laughs> this is what the face-to-face -face looks like. So in the big classroom in AL201, how many of you guys have been over in that room before? It's a real big space. It's a little less wide than ENS 280 if you've been in that other 500 student classroom. Um, it's, a, it's a nice kind of setup there. There I am at the front of the room saying something really profound. I want to just review briefly um, what we tend to do in the face-to-face -face and online session so you have a feel for um, what it would be like to be in this class. So on Tuesdays when we're face-to-face -face this spring, we make pretty extensive use of iClicker. This is not an iClicker sales pitch, but it's a really great tool more than anything for turning the classroom away from this unidirectional, I'm dumping things into your head model, to giving you more opportunities to interact. Um, the primary thing that I do is actually um, the use of the concept check question. So I've actually got my remote here that does all kinds of different things and actually has a pointer. These questions are great because I can do in the beginning of the semester a full month worth of questions that are just like the questions that they're gonna see on test number one. And for first semester freshmen who have no idea what that first test is going to look like, that can be very good in terms of alleviating their anxiety. Um, I can track attendance. I do demonstrations with them. So we do this really fun demonstration of an effect with memory where in a list of things, you remember things at the beginning and at the end, but not the stuff in the middle so much. And rather than just sort of throwing that chart up there, I'm actually able to use the clickers to gather data that are their own data and they generate their own U-shaped curve with that. Can do anonymous polling, can have them predict the outcomes of studies. What do you think is going to happen, right? Set up like the Milgram study about obedience. Like what percentage of people are going to go to the very end of the shock generator and maybe kill the guy in the adjoining room? And they guess a really small number and then the number's a lot higher and you get these gasps in the audience. It's very effective. And then peer instruction is a really terrific way of using um, peer interaction to help them help each other learn um, topics within the course. So use a lot of that um, as well as multimedia. So these you know, students are coming from um, a background where this is all part of their lives. So lots of videos and demonstrations, simulations of course related concepts, right? So you could talk about shaping and say they do that with Shamu at SeaWorld. But if they get a chance to have a virtual pigeon that they've got to train to do a full 360, then they really get the hang of what you're talking about. Online sessions, um, we use Collaborate. So this is the interface over here if you've never seen this or used this. <clears throat> you have a panel where you can push out your PowerPoint slides. You have a participant list. You've got a chat window. I'm speaking to them. I don't have them mic'd up on their end. I don't want to have 50 or 80 or 100 of them with mics talking um, back to me. Um, we do live sessions that are archived for later viewing. Very flexible. So this morning at 9.30, there are 480 students enrolled in that section. I had 50 there live. The rest of them are going in and doing it whenever they're doing it, because if they didn't, the test grades would be terrible. And the test grades haven't moved since we went to this model. Um, I'm trying to advance it like I do in the classroom. That's not going to work. Mini lectures, demonstrations, polling questions are basically analogous to what we would do face to face. So there's a polling tool where in, on this PowerPoint slide it would be a question and then they, up, up, up above the list of names they can click A, B, C, or D and we can do probably 98% of what we can do face to face we can do live online in there. Um, so I was going to ask you, um, 
what you think the biggest challenge might be. I'm going to tell you my answer, um, that the biggest challenge is reaching those students who are struggling in the course. M my number one frustration in a course where I get 20, 25% of them getting Ds, Fs, and w Ws is they don't come to me until it's too late, right? I don't know how many, how many of you guys have that experience, but especially in a big class, they will wait to week 13, and then they'll come in with tears in their eyes saying, if I fail, I'm going to get kicked out. And I'm like, there's, the math is against you now, right? There's no way with, you know, 15% of your points still available that you can make up for what you left behind. So why do you guys think that's such a big challenge in a bigger section? If you run up against that, why do you think... That's a problem, and the music has not gone away. They, they feel um, disconnected. Okay. They don't, they don't feel like they know you well. That you're accessible to them. That you, okay. Have you tried anything to make that distance? I mean, that's how I think about it, right? It's a physical distance, <laughs> literally, for the people in the back. But in, in, that, in that kind of course, have you tried I, strategies? I don't have big courses. I only have, like, 80. Okay. Yeah. That's a seminar, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, I, you know, but I think it's intrinsic in the big courses. Yeah. Because even when you send all the students that didn't do the first homework an email, right. they don't answer. You really have to know the face and stuff. Right. And it's so hard to get to know names and faces in a class that's that big. And, and, you know, I've done other things to try to sort of personalize myself so they realize, like, I'm not like, you know, this very intimidating guy. I'll show them pictures of my kids on the first day of class and say, if I'm not teaching the thousand of you, I'm probably at a baseball game with one of these guys. To make it feel like, oh, he's like a regular guy, and it doesn't really work. I mean, there's this sort of perceived distance there that is hard to get by. I tried getting a skateboarding class. Uh, I will not try that. <laughs> I was similarly unsuccessful. Okay. No. Okay. Other things that people have tried to, in a class that, as it gets larger, work around that distance? Yeah, Kathy. Uh, in a class where I had a lab, yeah. actually, or breakouts, I've actually uh, borrowed an idea from a friend where I had the students in the lab vote on a lab rep. Okay. There was one student who then met with me every week. It, it, lab reps all met with me every week, so I could learn about what was going in, on in the session. Okay. So if there were study sessions or something like that, or breakouts, if I had the reps, then I could talk to them. What it meant was I had a connection and a student whose voice could go back to the lab and explain why they were doing things that they were doing that they didn't like doing. Right. It wasn't me telling them. Plus, the lab reps, they felt really honored by it, and I actually would see them across <coughs> campus Right. Semesters later, and they would remind me where we met. Right. And so it gave me a connection with the class that I hadn't felt before. Right. So I could actually answer the questions through the voice of another student. Good. So, I mean, it's definitely a challenge. I think what we're trying to frame today is some strategies that you can try to use with what's in Blackboard now and hopefully going forward with a more souped up analytics package where you can reach out to those students that might get left behind. Um, but there was a, I think one of the conversations we're going to have later, at least in my mind, is so where is the line where your efforts stop and their efforts begin? Because when I was framing this for my wife, she's like, well, you're doing just all this hand-holding and at some point they need to do something too, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the kind of subtle things we, we should be talking about as we go forward. But what we're going to try to, to map out for you is some efforts we're making this spring to use some of the tools in Blackboard to, to reach out as far as is, you know, maybe appropriate um, and, and see how they respond to that. So we don't have all the answers. We don't have a magic bullet or a magic sauce, I guess, that will make this happen. But um, certainly we're, I think, moving in, in the right direction. And we've got some really fascinating data. So I want to stop talking and let us hear more about that. So I'll hand it back to you. All right. Thank you. That's another view of Mark's classroom. Um, and I, 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 I took that the day that we were uh, for uh, pa passing out the permission forms, the uh, informed consent thing to 500 students uh, in, across two different sections, which is quite amazing. So here's our study. And, and again, we, got, we, we sort of uh, officially got started on this in December sometime. Not much happened over Christmas break. Uh, and we got our gears going so that uh, uh, we actually have this thing running uh, right now. We're studying two classes, 
uh, Marx and uh, Helen Nobles, and uh, two sections of each, uh, Tuesday at 8 and Tuesday at, uh, at 9.30 for, for Mark, and uh, two different days at 4 o'clock uh, for the stat class. Also, not in the same room, but a, but a similarly huge uh, uh, smart, or whatever they call them, 500-seat <laughs> vomitorium, whatever they're called. <laughs> Originally, we talked about, let's say, OK, wow, this is great. We've got two sections of two classes. Let's assign one section to have one thing and the other section to another. And then we realized, based on some things Mark actually said, that these sections are different from each other. And Mark's, Mark's hunch was, uh, based on hi history and prior experience, was that the only people who show up there are the ones who were too lazy to sign up for this. <laughs> so it, by and large, this, this, uh, the, that 8 o'clock section was, uh, was going to be different. So uh, we decided instead to random, randomly assign people across both sections. And so what, essentially what we have is two different studies going in parallel, because the the, the, the kinds of things we're doing are naturally somewhat different in a stack class than in Mark's class. Uh, but but it, within each of them, there are people in each section, some of whom are the experimental group and some are the uh, control. Everybody uh, does a number of things. One, they committed to get to, to fill out some timesheets. Why timesheets? Because the, the, the definition or sort of the, what, what, what drives learning analytics is the stuff that you can measure inside Blackboard, the stuff that happens inside a learning management system. But we also had a hunch that things happen outside of that system. So we wanted people to talk about time they spent away from the screen, reading the textbook, if there is an actual paper textbook, talking to somebody else about the class, just thinking about it or doing, doing homework. So we asked them to fill out timesheets. And in addition, we asked, uh, do we want to know a little bit more about them than we usually do in a class? So we had them fill out a, 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 a measure of their content knowledge in psychology or stat, uh, as well as a, a, a measure of uh, motivation. Everybody did that. The experimental folks also, this is the key thing, received emailed suggestions if their performance in the class trips one or more triggers. So that's where we're using the data from Blackboard to make something different happen. Here's the course interest survey. Just, I'm sure you can read every word there. Basically, it's measuring a couple of things. People's perceived, the, the, the degree to which they perceive the course to be relevant and the degree to which they perceive themselves to be confident at succeeding in the class. Those are two measures out of a larger model uh, called ARCs that looks at how people approach a class and with, with their initial motivation. So we got that for everybody. These are the timesheets, which are, are kind of cool. We're asking them essentially to, to create sentences that say, on Tuesday, I attended the lecture offline with classmates for 75 minutes. On Wednesday, I worked on chapter five practice problems online by myself for 30 minutes. So they make those sentences by filling out this form. So it only takes a couple minutes to complete this form once a week and then turn it in. So we, we have sentences anywhere from one to 10 sentences describing how people spent their time uh, every week. And that provides some very interesting data. So the triggers in the in <laughs> How many of you are too young to know who Trigger was? Yeah. Time to retire. To retire that slide. So uh, um, the triggers are these. And, and these are, I mean, part of this, this thing is, you, you know, we're, t we're taking this from a design research point of view. We don't have this great theory of big classes that, that have high DFW rates. There's not a theory of that anywhere. So we make up our treatments. We, we adjust them and massage them as we go in consort with the two instructors in the class. So Mark uh, had a heavy hand in sort of helping us identify what the trigger should be. What are the things that happen that you can measure and observe in a class that should trigger some kind of response that might help people pass the class or not drop out. So uh, clicker points means they didn't show up for the, the live lecture, uh, or at least if they did, they didn't bother to click anything. Uh, a low test grade in, how many tests have you had so far? Two. Two, so if they get a low test grade, and we've only done a one intervention on that so far. Two, yeah. Okay. Uh, in Psych Portal, they do this, these uh, learning curve quizzes that Mark can talk about more if you, if you like, but it basically they're little practice quizzes. 
And, uh, and finally, if they didn't lock in, log into Blackboard at all, then really it's like not being in the same planet as your course. <laughs> so we note that as well. That's, so these are the four triggers that we're, we're looking at at the moment. <laughs> now the interventions, the, uh, the ways in which... Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here, here's one of the interventions. The interventions are not you know, pulling, the, pulling these kids off into a room somewhere and, and barraging them with good thoughts. They are emails. Uh, and so the emails come out, and they look sort of like this. This is the one for no clicker points. And I'll, I'll, well, I'll read it to you. I, I was just reviewing. This is, you have to read this in Mark's voice. Maybe you ought to read this, Mark. I was just reviewing the clicker points from yesterday's class in our Blackboard guidebook, gradebook, and notice you didn't get any of those points, which means that you either were absent or forgot your clicker, and so on. So, and he talks here about the fact that uh, he's got data over the years that, that says uh, he's got percentages here of likelihood of failing if you don't show up. Woody Allen said 80% of life is just showing up. Uh, and so there are all this. And so that letter from him uh, is, is what they got if they didn't show up. Uh, here's another one. This, this, this one, I like. this has a different tone. And one of the things we're experimenting with is the tone of these missives. Uh, and this one... I think you got in touch with your feminine side when you wrote this, Mark. Um, <laughs> it's easy, given I'm surrounded by boys at home. Uh, so uh, he, th this is if they got a low test grade. It's very nurturing. And uh, uh, in invite him to, inviting people to come chat with him uh, afterwards. And, and I'm here to help you succeed. These are nice things. It's, it's a little less, uh, I don't know, is Old Testament godlike than the first one. Yeah, well, <laughs> you faked it well, Mark. So. Uh, um, anyway, th this, this uh, goes out for a low test grade on so far on, on one test, but we'll do it again for the second test uh, pretty soon. So those are the uh, interventions. Now, you may well ask, okay, that's all right for you. You've got, you've got this whole thing going with a, in a, a formal study, but we want to make sure that you come out of this session with some ideas on how you can do something like this in your own classes with just the tools you already have available. And I'm going to turn it over to Kim now, who is, I, I have to tell you, one of the most amazing uh, students I've ever had uh, working with me on anything. I had, I had Kim for a class last year. She's not, I wish I could say she's a learning design major, but she's a philosophy major. She took some of our classes. But she taught herself Python in a couple of weeks in order to do the kind of data extraction that we needed for this study. So you are an amazing person. Go tell them how to do this. <laughs> So uh, my goal is just to do a brief overview of a few of Blackboard's features that are useful um, for determining which students you might want to intervene with and for contacting those students. Um, one feature is the Grade Center's Email Selected Users tool. Um, first, you order the column you're interested in so that it sorts from lowest score to highest score. Um, this column could contain quiz scores, um, clicker points, total points. You could even sort the last access column so that you get an idea of which students haven't as accessed Blackboard in a while or at all. Um, you could, let's see, uh, you would then select the users that you would like to contact um, by placing a check mark next to their names. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and then um, hovering over email and clicking email selected users. You will be asked to provide the content of the email and to click submit when you're ready. So that's an easy and simple feature. Um, you can do something very similar with what's called the early warning system. Uh, with the early warning system, you can create a couple different types of criteria that must be met in order for a student to qualify for an intervention. Um, I already have two criteria created here. Um, a criterion can be based on the grade of a particular item, the last time a student accessed Blackboard, um, or the number of days a student has missed the um, due date. Once a rule is created, you can use the review rule status page to send an email notification to the appropriate students. Unfortunately, um, right now the system cannot be set up from the very beginning um, and run on its own for the rest of the semester. You must refresh the system each time you want to make a new query. 
This consists in placing a, pe a check mark right next to the criterion and then clicking refresh. The early warning system will be replaced the, with the retention center, which here. <laughs> um, and when we move to the new service pack, which I believe will be later this year, um, I'm told that one of the huge highlights is that the retention center reports run automatically without you having to refresh the system, um, and then sends you an email or a text with the results. So that's something really neat. Um, in our study, we've had to take a slightly more difficult route just because we've had to um, distinguish between the students in the control group and the students in the experimental group. Um, but our focus has thus far been on the kinds of data that these two first features provide. Um, that is, we've been looking for students with no scores, low scores, and insufficient access to Blackboard. But a third feature Blackboard offers, and one that is probably of interest to some of you, um, is the ability to turn on statistics tracking for a particular item. Um, if a particular item has statistics tracking turned on, then you can access a statistics report, like this one. Um, this report tells you how many times each student accessed the item, and on which day, and what time of the day the item gets accessed the most. Theoretically, you can adjust the time period so that you know when in the semester the item is the most popular. Um, but if you have hundreds of students, at least in my experience, it can kind of lag. So um, I don't consider it to be really reliable in producing that sort of information. Um, so as a quick overview, to, you turn on statistics tracking on a particular item by clicking the double down arrows uh, next to the item and selecting statistics tracking on off. And to access the statistics report, you click on the same double down arrows next to the item and click on view statistics report. Um, we are currently working on getting more information um, on student access with Collaborate, but so far it's been pretty difficult determining which students did not attend the live session and did not view the archive recording. So we're working on that, and hopefully we'll have a solution to it um, maybe by the end of the semester. And that's all I have. <laughs> so what have we learned so far? And, and and again, this would be a whole different presentation if, this, if it was a month from now. But uh, given where we are with this thing, uh, we have some data. We have some things to report that are uh, kind of interesting. <coughs> First of all, looking at the time that learners are spending. Well, let me step back again. I, 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 those of you who read fast already know the answer to this. <laughs> <laughs> you teach a three-credit class. How many hours a week do you think your students spend on a three-credit class? Nine? That's how many they're supposed to spend on a, on a, a three-hour class, I believe. But, but in, in actuality, given that they're also taking other people's three-unit classes and they are every bit as scintillating as you are, yeah, well, the answer is lower than you would like to hear. So here, here, here are the answers from Mark's class. And, I, and I'm guessing these are probably typical. Uh, the, um, can I have your... Yeah. These are hours including class. Yes, I know. Maybe yeah. <laughs> this is Mark's. This is Mark's uh, uh, 9:30 class. The good guys, and uh, and uh, isn't it? Yeah. And so uh, you can see. First of all, there's an ebb and flow. You can see that ebb and flow is common to all four sections. <laughs> That's yes, it is. So they're not coming to class. So they're doing nothing. It's I'm too many of them coming, so it would just be class. Well, class? The, these are averages, and there's quite a range. There are people. There are people we noticed in Mark's 9:30 section, for example. There was one kid who described uh, spending, I think, 12 hours one week, um, and and, the, and what he described doing was making. He was. He, he took notes in the lecture. He took notes in the recording of the lecture. He made flashcards. He reviewed the flashcards. And He's the outlier. Yeah, he, well, he was at the extreme. And at the other extreme, one of the things that gives me confidence that people are reporting this honestly is that some people took the time to say, I put in zero hours. 
you know, be, mainly because because they because of that they need the extra credit that will come with uh, participating in this study. <laughs> And no, the extra credit is 1% of the course grade. So it's this tiny little slope. They don't know math either. Stephen? <laughs> well, there's, that maybe answered it, but this is a, these are averages. So the question Correct. was, you know, is it a failure to report, in other words, disengagement, to actually do the reporting versus a disengagement with activity within the class? Well, the, the numbers doing this, it, it's, it's a, I think less than half of the people in the experimental group are actually turning this in. And, and we we're, we're, we have to send out some more reminders to get them to do this, because they don't see it. It's, it's I don't know. Uh, it's, it's something we need to work on to get a higher level of participation. But, but they, they did participate in this and say zero. Some, uh, met, every single week, there's somebody who said they, did, they put in zero hours. Uh, yes? I guess one of the way I think about it is, is thinking about it as a variance. Right. Yeah. The real bearings would be the question. Next time I make this graph, I'll put in the little things like in the stock stock market thing with the with the you know one one sigma above and below because because the, the, there is quite a range. Yes. So it went down March 30th because that was spring, spring break. break. Yeah. yeah, that last week of spring break. So, but actually, some people still did a non-zero claim to have done a non-zero amount of uh, work on their classes uh, last week. So we don't you know and and obviously that's an aberration in the in the ebb and flow of a semester expect to see the rest of the semester to come back up with with a probably a peak in the last week before before the semester begins yes I teach a small class and I noticed that uh, the Thursday before spring break I think I had the lowest attendance yeah. ever yeah. people were taking spring break early oh, yeah. right oh, it's like Thanksgiving is now a week and a half long yeah. same same <laughs> same sort of thing Marcy Make sure I understand what the date is the date the report's due and the reporting on the week prior. This is uh, this is the date that the week begins. <laughs> so the, the the reports go Sunday to s Sunday to Saturday night. Okay. So uh, yeah, that is spring break week there. Okay. Yeah. Are you tracking students' responses to these reminders as well? And what I, what I'm particularly interested in is what types of students respond to what types of. Uh, reminders, for example, the nurturing ones, uh, to yeah. particular types of students respond to those better than other types within the classroom, and the not so nice ones, are you getting different students who respond? You, you anticipate my final slide. We, uh, so we have all that data, we haven't even looked at it yet because we're not. I don't think anything we've done has really had a chance to make an impact on, on their performance in, a, in any kind of deep way. We've only we've got seven weeks worth of data here. So at the end of the semester, though, we will have that, and that is certainly one of the things we want to look at. All right. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? So Steve. For the message you send, it's pushed out, but you don't know if they read it right. or anything. So is there, a, is there like a click-through to get to the message that's signal, single? It arrives in their mail just like any other announcement from Blackboard, I believe. Is that right? Is that right, Kim? Yeah. So you think we would want like a cons confirmed receipt? Would be, kind then of you thing? know who actually actively even looked at it right. versus going, oh, it's Lamecas, delete. Because that's why. <laughs> 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 yeah. Did, did you ever consider of doing things different during the semester? I know that when I did this by hand, first two weeks I'm trying to push and get everyone on board. But people that fall off the boat like four weeks ago, how yep. late a semester, why would I bother keeping sending them emails? It, uh, in, in our ongoing conversation, John, John, um, John and I uh, have talked about modifying this thing based on what we learn as we go. So we're now at the point where we've got enough data that we could do that. Uh, we haven't done it yet, but we will we, we'll probably make some adjustments. Uh, again, in conversation with with Mark and Helen to see what what might work better, and and John just came back from that conference in Indianapolis and said and brought back a paper that was very interesting because it talks about uh, bringing students into the conversation about what the interventions should be and shaping them during the semester with their involvement. So it's it's even more proactive and more engaging and more flexible, more changing over time to respond to the situation. So you know we we acknowledge right up front we didn't know exactly what would work. But we're we're trying to figure that out and gathering data on what works and what doesn't as we go. Yeah. Just getting back to this slide, um, did you say that the response rate on the timesheets was like half? Yeah. Okay. So how, is it is it is it more the control or have you noticed if it's more the control or the treatment group that's responding or not? Uh, I don't know. 
Yeah, I, that's a good question. That, that's one of the things we would, we would wanna, wanna look at, yeah. That, that's an excellent question, actually. Let's move on. How many interventions, how many emails have we sent out for this? Now again, uh, in Mark's class, the total number in the experimental group is 200 something, 227, I think. So the first one that went out uh, went to 60 of them. I feel, what was the first intervention about? What was the uh, trigger? They didn't complete the quizzes, right? Yeah. Quizzes. So basically they have quizzes due Sunday night at 11 o'clock. So on Monday morning, Kim comes in and says, okay, I'm gonna grab all the people that didn't complete the quizzes and then they, they get the email. So that was the biggest one. And then later ones, maybe that put the fear of God into them and they, they have behaved well ever since. Probably not. <laughs> but, but that was the largest one. The rest have been hitting, again, out of, out of 200 people, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent, 15 and 20 percent of, of, uh, of the people that are, you know, potentially going to get one. But there may be a downward trend here. I don't know. Even if we exclude this, it looks like it might be going down. I think there's, there's something. A, a, again, it depends on what the trigger was, because that has a sort of place in the, in the schedule of the class. This will have maybe more structure when we have a whole semester in front of us, and we can see more like what's going on. But then the next question is, that's how many mails went, emails went out. How many students got more than one of these? And so here's the answer, because I just figured this out this morning. Uh, it's roughly in one-thirds of, of the group. That group over there on the far right, those are the ones who got zero emails. They, they, they have done nothing to offend Zeus and, and, and are thus not getting any thunderbolts from Blackboard. Um, this, also a third or so, uh, did it once. They got, they got one tr transgression that, that triggered an intervention. And the other third is these. This is these two, two emails, three, four, five, six. And there were seven possible emails. Nobody got all seven. <laughs> so, but but two, two people out of 200, 1%, got uh, two of these things. Got six, of six. six of these things, yeah. They thought they were going to get a free sandwich or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that, again, that... We can probably, how would you characterize these people, Mark, in terms of passing the course? They are not going to pass. Yeah. And the, your non-pass is 20% or so? Yeah, 20-ish. Yeah. Okay. So that's probably this chunk, perhaps. Well, we, again, we'll be able to test that assumption uh, at the end of the semester. So uh, we're not at the end yet. We're only in the middle. What will we know at the end? We'll be able to ask if the interventions change, the change the amount of time that they report spending on the class. If they got interventions, do they say, oh, better pay attention to this class and, and uh, at least report more time spent. Uh, actually, this is the critical one. It should be first. Did the interventions actually raise their grades? Because that's, that's why, we're, why we're here. That's why we're doing it. Did the interventions change their evaluations of the faculty? Because, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if it changes it in a negative way, then that's kind of a deal breaker for you know, <laughs> scaling this up. More likely, I think, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a positive thing, I would think, yeah. But since evaluations are presumably anonymous, how are you going to turn the control? Uh, well, we can, we'll, we'll look at the experimental versus the control. Because, uh, yeah. But, but, but you don't know who you don't know who's know. the evaluation. The evaluations themselves, you don't know whether. You that's true, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so dang, we should have done it by section instead of within sections, huh? Yeah. But you can do it your own evaluation. Not separate from that. You could do it the same evaluation, a slightly different evaluation class. We could, we could historically look at last year's version of this class. You've asked too many questions. Shut up. <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. I'm just wondering if you can embed a question in your, in your treatment population, if that would be street legal to, to actually have two parallel course evaluations that actually embed one question that would identify them as being within that population mm. and still be anonymous. Yeah. It's probably yeah. too late to do that. Never too late. Oh, okay. Can I have them do the clicker survey? Absolutely. You could just yeah. add, maybe add a couple questions. So yeah. Yeah. Cool. Right, so that's, we're modifying the study as we go, and that's a great idea. Uh, which triggers 
you know, does it matter if they never log into Blackboard? If they are they somehow able to learn the course without even doing anything electronic about it? Yeah, some triggers will probably be more effective at identifying people with problems versus not. Did looking at the way they came in, in terms of their motivation, in any way predict their performance in the class? Because if it does, then that's you know that's a very easy measure to give, and it might give you a head start on on uh, working with with these kids. Can we identify those likely to trigger interventions on day one? That is, can we look at that thing, that motivation measure, as well as the other data that we already know about the students outside the course before the class? Could we know on day one who we need to sort of set aside and say, you know, we, we, we want to help you before you need help? How do students feel about the interventions? We will, um, in, in the course of evaluations, ask something about that. Don't tell IRB. Um, <laughs> And how do the faculty feel about it? We've already interviewed them at the beginning of the class. We'll interview them at the end of the class and, and, and ask, you know, to what extent is this worth doing? And what else can we try? And that's why I'm already getting ideas from, from this discussion. This is really a pilot, a pilot of a pilot, to figure out what are the things that we can be doing. So uh, we're at the point where we will be taking a break. We'll, we can take a few questions now, but then we're going to take a little break. And then after that, uh, the, the dessert is that Mark and Kim will demonstrate, not just with slides, but live, ways to get into the entrails of Blackboard and, and see what your students have been up to and, and figure out how to do it. And, and also, uh, part of the conversation I want to have is, you know, you have to propose some things to IRB about, you know, students are going to be anonymous or whatever, but the email is actually sent by Kim. They respond to the email and they respond to me. And so they say, oh, I got this email saying I didn't complete the quizzes, but I thought I did, when in fact they really didn't. So I want to talk about, you know, sort of the logistics of how it actually works in the real world, right? Or you saw the, you know, the nice, what did you say, whatever email. Um, after the test, I sent the email saying come and see me during office hours. When they come to office hours now, I'm actually asking them, were you triggered to come here by that email with the low test score? And um, I'm just sort of, I write down the names of anybody who comes to see me during office hours because they never do. Um, and so I put like a little star next to those names, but then I just sort of stick that paper away and I'm not tracking that or whatever. But th there's this sort of, you know, where the research meets, you know, the reality of teaching the course. And we want to know, like, we want to know how many people come to see you after they do poorly on the test. And so far the answer is one, <laughs> one person coming in. Yeah. Okay, I'm just wondering, I have in these big classes students that on purpose say me, like in week five of the class, I'm heading for an F. And the reason is that they take physics, mathematics, chemistry, and something else, and they find out that actually in all these classes you have to spend nine hours a week, that they have a 50 hour a week workload, they cannot do it, they go to advisors, the advisor says pick one of your classes, get an F on that, and do well on the other ones. And so is there a way that in Blackboard you can at some point say, oh, forget about the interviewing these students. They have told me they're not trying anymore. Right. Can you repeat that yeah. so everyone can hear it? Yeah, so the question was about is there a way to sort of <coughs> stop trying to intervene with students who effectively have quit out of the course after the drop period has ended and sort of there's no point to trying to intervene because they're not going to want to change. They're, they're, you're this, they're done. Um, I know I have those students. I mean, I know, like, my, at my final, I know that 5 to 8 percent of them will not show up and take the final because they know they're getting a D or an F. Um, I've had students literally ask me during office hours, should I even bother to come and take the final? I don't know if you've ever had that. Qu that is a I bizarre tell question. Didn't bother to come yeah. and take well, the my final. response is the opposite. I'm like, I don't ever believe in quitting anything. Yeah, yeah. Like, if you're down by 30 in a basketball game with a minute left, uh, you don't just walk off the court and quit. Like, that's not a good way to run your life. Uh, so, I don't know, that's my response, but. Yeah. Well, I want to follow up on your wife's comments. Yeah. Yes. You know, how, much, how much of this is our responsibility and how much of it is theirs? Right. Where is that line? Right. Because you know, I'm, I'm not their mother. Right. You know, I'm not, I'm not paid to, to hover over them and right. make sure they're doing what they're supposed to. They're supposed to be adults. Right. So, you know, where, where is the line? Where you see the line. Right. I mean, I, I, my, my feeling is the email doesn't feel like it goes too far. 
Um, although in this room, about five or six years ago when I did this informally, I, I had done what, what you were describing, Arlette, where I reached into Blackboard myself and sent this email out, and I recounted having sent out that email to 100 students, and I had one student come to office hours, and one of the responses from somebody in the room was, well, I don't think that's enough. I don't think sending the email was, I, you didn't do enough. And my response is like, what, should I go knock on their doors or follow them to their cars or, yeah. So I mean, you know, I, I feel like that's that's adequate. Um, I mean, I, I would even in my mind want to go maybe one more step where I, I, I sort of envision a scenario where maybe what happens. And I've talked with the publisher who does a lot of the the quizzing materials I use in my course. Like, is there a way for me after test one? to not only just grab that list of students who got a, an F on the, on the first test, but then have a curated package of materials that will help them do better on test two. So here's a set of extra activities I'm going to want you to do, some videos I'm going to want you to watch, some additional learning materials, so that when test two rolls around, and maybe it's targeted towards you know, the five big ideas in part two of the course that I know they're going to struggle with. And maybe if they do that, they can earn back a very small percentage of the points that they missed. Like, I'd feel like I could go that far, but that's, for me, that's where I start to feel like I'm getting over the line and doing too much. I mean, this reminds me of when I was in grad school learning, you know, to do therapy. You know, the, the, one of my, one of my um, supervisors said, when you start working harder than the client does, then that's a problem. And, and that's why I feel like for, for teaching, it's a similar thing. Like, if you start doing more than they're doing, like, they've got to want to do something. Um, and I think some of them do, and I think some of them, it doesn't matter. I, was just about, I think that's great question. if your grading system is not based on distribution. Mm -hmm. If it's, if it's a mastery based, I think that's great. But if you're setting yourself up for real potential problems, if you grade on a scale, where providing additional opportunities early on allows a student to leapfrog someone else in the final sum of assessment. Right. That's that's a whole other discussion about right. how to grades, yeah. but, but being very sensitive and careful about that. I think it's great that you know scaffold and provide additional stuff. Sure. I think making it available to everyone, right. but then pointing people in that direction actively. <clears throat> And seeing that who access it, who doesn't, will be right. I think the people that don't need would access it more. Right. Yeah, I, the students that do it, they're, they're getting A's and B's. I mean, that, that, my, my experience is they're the ones, when you offer something like that, mm -hmm. like, you don't really need to do it. It's those guys, but those guys don't always go and do it. Yeah. Which that actually ties into the comment I was going to make, and I agree with Stephen that I would think if you offer that special set of opportunities to the students who are struggling, and especially if you allow them to earn some points, right. I, what I would anticipate is that when word gets out yeah. to hey, the better what's going students, on with that? Yeah. now a B student's going to come in and say, well, wait a minute, you didn't give me that opportunity. Right. I'd like to try and ratchet up to an A. Right. right. And in my mind, I would make it, I mean, like 1% of the course grade or something. Does it matter if it's that small? Yeah. Well, I just, um, what I've seen with offering 1% for anything, they will chase that. I mean, they will chase 1% and then they will not study for the test that's worth 20% of the grade. Because they can't do math. It's totally irrational. I mean, it's that, you know, Dan Ariely stuff. Yeah. So, uh, I just want to, I, I, the discussion's going richly, so I don't want to take a real formal break, but I do want to remind people who need to go that they should enter the raffle. Uh, but I want to ask a question, um, and that relates to IRB issues, because yes. I know you mentioned it, so you must have IRB. And I'm just wondering how you explained to the IRB panel that by doing this intervention that you really thought would be good, wasn't equal, it wasn't a disadvantage for me as a student not to be part of the group. So how did you do that? We yeah, that's a great question, uh, and they got after us quite a bit, and you're reminding me that we m maybe haven't fully implemented what we said we were going to do yet. Uh, <laughs> and you're but, on but, camera. Yeah. <laughs> Erase this. Uh, bas basically, we said that we would be pointing them to different resources uh, that, uh, uh, you know, just sort of advice on how to, how to finish the class, and so we, we told them we would be putting a place on, the, on Blackboard available to everybody that says, if you're falling behind, here are some, here are some tips. And that would be available to, to anyone. So the difference would be having to go there and click on that and read it versus getting it pushed to you via email. 
so so uh, that that that's that's really the, I think probably the best the best way to, to get at it. But yeah, we were very sensitive to providing something that uh, that might work and, and not providing it to everybody. Mm -hmm. and so, but on the other hand, if you don't do that, how how can you ever right. do educational research? Exactly. So. The other interesting thing that came up actually this week with, with the one student who came in um, that was triggered by the, the email, um, in one of the conversations with her, she said, because the Thursday stuff is online, she goes, I don't really carve out any time at all on Thursdays for this course. And she goes, it's sort of like I do Tuesday because we're face to face and we're doing clickers and everything. And then Thursday, like, yeah. And I find myself coming then the next Tuesday and I... I miss the episode in between, right? And you start, and I don't really know what you're talking about. And that's why um, Kim mentioned the difficulty. One of the other triggers is the, the collaborate viewing, whether they're there live or view the recording. I want to know and reach out to students who are not basically doing the Thursday session, right? They're not there live. They don't view the archive before Tuesday morning rolls around. The problem is really not us. It's the way that Blackboard and Collaborate kind of report those data. It's not easy to extract that, but that will be really important. And, and I just think for designing courses, it's important to know that if you choose this, you know, we'll meet one day and not meet the other. When you're not meeting, you're totally off their radar. Um, so my intervention for her was to say, you need to either A, be there live on Thursdays, or B, carve out a time between noon on Thursday and noon on Friday, where that's in your schedule, I'm viewing the archive. Thursday evening at 6 or Friday morning at 9, whatever it is, so that it becomes part of the schedule. I feel like if it's not built into their schedule, you know, it's definitely not going to get done. So another interesting thing that we discovered, I think, I didn't even tell you that, but that, that just happened yesterday. If you're finding that that's true, yeah. that when you do the online session that there's students who are just, you know, blowing, right. it, blowing it off for whatever reason, right. And I mean, you're doing those lectures anyways on Thursday. I, I guess I would have to ask, what's the real advantage of doing this as a hybrid? Would right. it be better to do two face-to-face -face right. sessions? Yeah, a part of the advantage of doing the hybrid is my department now has one giant section of social psych instead of four individual smaller sections. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I mean, it was, that was literally the conversation in summer of 09 when there was no money for anything. Um, the, the department chair wanted to size up three or four hundred to 150 classes into that, but there was no more time in the schedule for the 500C classroom. So he said, could we do this? I'm like, well, this is, you know, what they said never to do hybrid for this purpose, but, you know, <laughs> when you've got some kind of tool, I can bang it with this thing and see if it will work. Um, I mean, the good news was we got paired together with, um, with faculty that were willing to learn what was necessary to go in that direction. And the funny thing is in, in having the classes arranged this way, students will come to the wrong class and sometimes not even know that they're in the wrong class. I mean, so I've, I've had students come and they're like ready to take my test and they're like, you're not only not in my class, the other professor is female. <laughs> you know, I mean, so, I mean, is that or the Kurt Lindemann story? I don't know if you've ever heard the Kurt Lindemann story for me. Kurt Lindemann, who teaches the giant comm class, goes to Starbucks and orders coffee and they put Lamacus on the cup. <laughs> and he doesn't look like me. I mean, he's a balding guy with glasses and he just we're just different. And they rate Lamacus because it's just some white guy down there, whatever. There he is. Um, so, <laughs> Um, this is the stuff that happens when you do this. So. Well, I'm, I'm okay. And they misspell my name, which kind of annoys me, but, you know, whatever. So. Well, well, please join me in, in thanking our speakers, and please do stay around because I want to see some hands-on stuff. So thank you.